Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today and a very warm welcome to the Studio SML online talk, How to Survive as a Small Design Studio in Singapore. This event is presented by the Press Room and is supported by the Design Singapore Council and the National Design Centre. I'm Felicia from the Design Singapore Council and I will be your MC for today. So today's session, How to Survive as a Small Design Studio in Singapore, is the first talk organized by Studio SML, a website and podcast channel by the Press Room that seeks to archive in-depth stories of designers and their journeys. Featuring design studios of various sizes, today's session will explore how size could affect a studio's culture and the projects that they do. So with that, it's my absolute pleasure to present our speakers for today. First up, we have Gabriel Tan, Creative Director and Founder of Gabriel Tan Studio, a design practice that works at cultural intersections. Gabriel is also the Creative Director of Interior Design Studio Antimatter, Singapore door handle brand Turn, Japanese furniture brand Ariake, and Portuguese craft brand Origin. His works have won awards like the Industrial Designers Society of America's Idea Award, Japan Good Design Award, and the President's Design Award 2010. Following which, we have Jessica Wong and Pamela Ting, co-founders of Sinsheng. Sinsheng is a contemporary furniture, homeware, and lifestyle label based in Singapore with roots firmly planted in Asian heritage. Their concepts have earned various honours at the Singapore Creator Awards 2019, ASEAN Furniture Design Competition 2018, and the 2016 International Furniture Fair Singapore Design Stars. And next up, we have Randy Chan, Principal Architect and Founder of Zark Collaboratives. Randy's architectural and design experience crosses multiple fields and skills and is guided by the simple philosophy that architecture and aesthetics are part of the same impulse. His projects have received accolades like the Singapore Institute of Architects Gold Medal for 38 Holland Park in 2010 and the President's Design Award Design of the Year 2012 for his collaborative artwork, Building as a Body. And last but not least, we have Sim Boon Yang, co-founder of EcoEat Architects. EcoEat is a multidisciplinary practice with a modern and progressive approach to design with an emphasis on balancing aesthetics with rigor and program with budget. The studio has won awards at various ceremonies like the 2015 World Architecture Festival and the President's Design Award, Design of the Year 2008. So without further ado, I would now be passing the time over to Kelly Cheng, our moderator for today, to officially open the session. Kelly is the brains behind Studio SML and the creative director and founder of The Press Room, a publishing and design consultancy. She has served as an adjunct lecturer in Singapore universities and has sat on international design judging panels such as the Red Dot Awards, Design for Asia Award, Creative Circle Award, and James Dyson Award. Kelly was also recently named Designer of the Year at the 2020 President's Design Award. So Kelly, over to you, please. Thanks, Felicia. Okay. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, first talk series of Studio SML. So uh, I want to share a little bit about the inspiration behind uh, starting this self-initiated project. Um, I, I think for the past 20 years, I've been an uh, editor of magazine and kind of unknowingly, I realized that I've been documenting the design scene in Singapore. And uh, in the last few years, you know, I, it was quite funny because I got a lot of requests, people asking like, oh, you know, uh, can I, you know, can you send me that article that you published the other time? Can you... Uh, is it okay we use this picture from the magazine and so on and so forth? And I realized that I, I have such a huge archiver of uh, stories and materials of local designers. But I think the one that, that really triggered me to, to act on this idea of Studio SML was uh, two, two years ago when uh, uh, one of our master architect, uh, Terry Hill, passed, passed away. Um, I realized that I, I held on to uh, one of his last interviews, which I did for Singapore Architect. And uh, with the interview, I actually requested for uh, Kerry to do a self-sketch, which he happily obliged because he, he loves to draw, actually. So um, when he passed on, uh, his family and his uh, studio uh, start to ask me for the sketch because none of them archived it, you know. And uh, the, other, the other thing is also, up to today, some of the developers who are, you know, um, uh, develop, uh, who had Kerry Hill as their architect, are still asking me for the sketch. So it, it just made me realize how important uh, Archiver is. And also that I think since, uh, since the independence of Singapore, I think currently we are seeing sort of like the fifth, sixth generation of architects. Architecture being one of the oldest discipline in Singapore. Uh, we have Boon today, who is I think a fourth generation. Randy is a fifth generation. And then now currently we already have the sixth generation of architects practicing. We, we have already lost the stories of the first, second generation. 
Sure, they are, you know, some of their works are archived and uh, their stories may be archived in a more academic way and all that. Yeah, so I always lament the, the fact that there is not, uh, why is there not uh, such a platform that kind of share these uh, stories of designers from Singapore, you know, uh, we, we, we need to archive this so that we can start to have a design legacy. And we're already losing our first, second generation of architects and all that. Some of the design disciplines, uh, such as product design, graphic design, fashion design, are relatively uh, young and new. So I think we should start now so that we can uh, document them from the beginning. So it was really with that, uh, with that kind of uh, simple aspiration to, to document uh, stories of Singapore designers so that we can build up a, a design history archive. And from there, uh, my dream is that a design culture for Singapore can evolve. Uh, yeah, so that is the, the aspiration that I have for Studio SML. And um, so the, the intent for Studio SML is really to, to entertain and to educate at the same time. I, I hope that this platform can bridge the distance between entertainment and design. Uh, to reach out to a bigger audience beyond just the design community. Um, that's why I decided to start a website instead of having a book or whatever. Anyway, you know, we, we need this to be an ongoing thing. So the website is the best platform. People can read when they're free and all that. And it's free for all. Anybody can read it, not just from Singapore. Uh, people from abroad globally can also uh, learn about the stories of Singapore designers, which I, I think would be really great also in promoting Singapore design. Um, so that's why I wanted to do this project on, uh, on a website. And also that uh, we actually have a, a podcast alongside this website because I think that the podcast uh, platform is a new frontier. Uh, people are getting so busy and so lazy these days, you know, they watching a three minute video is too long for them. One minute also too long, you know. So uh, podcast is very good because people can be doing their things and they can listen in the background. People can be driving and they can be listening and all that. So uh, this project uh, to me is also very fun in some way because it is the first time that our studio, the press room, produce a podcast and uh, with the help of my team, you know, all of us are first timers in producing a podcast, but, but we were so hands-on, we, we designed the audio branding, we did the jingle, we did the editing, we did everything on ourselves, you know, uh, we did the studio and, and I'm very, uh, very, very proud of the outcome and very happy that the, the team actually everybody rub their sleeves and help with this uh, website and, and podcast. The, the third uh, reason why I'm doing Studio SML is that uh, it is also actually a study of design studios and how they grow. Um, some studios are one-man show, some are small, some are medium-sized, and, and some grew exponentially and become big studios. Um, and as a person who has run studios for, for 20 years, it, you know, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very fascinating for me, you know. Is it by choice? Is it by luck? Is it how, you know, how do some studios grow so big and then some decide to be small and all that? Um, I, I think that there is not a very clear science behind this because every architect, every designer uh, kind of like, we're not trained in business, so we can't run it organically and all that. And uh, this is why uh, in the launch exhibition for Studio SML, I call all the design studios abstract creatures because we just survive in a kind of a very weird way on, on ourselves. And um, lastly, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about this talk series. Um, it, I hope that this talk series can, can carry on beyond COVID um, because um, I think that it is important for us to have this kind of sort of informal symposiums uh, very much like salon style kind of a talk session that, you know, provides a platform for the design community to talk about, uh, you know, sometimes issues in the industry or to talk about difficult uh, topics, you know, uh, in a very informal setting so that uh, we can all share and kind of uh, come together, you know, to, to see how this uh, can work out. And I think this, uh, this kind of uh, culture it's very common with uh, actually the third generation architects like William Lim and, and Teng Kwan Lee. Uh, William Lim is known for his uh, sort of living room salon style uh, talks, you know, and a lot of his conferences are born out of this uh, very, very informal talks. And uh, Teng Kwan Lee used to invite students and architects to, to his studio, you know, to, to share and he had his projector, he give us free beer and all that. And uh, I really miss the... Uh, this kind of bonding, you know, with, uh, with the design industry. And I hope that still SML can provide this platform 
for uh, for the older designers and architects like uh, like us, we can provide the platform, and the younger people can come forth and you know share stories with us and you know learn from us in some ways. And uh, in better times when uh, COVID is over, uh, I really hope that still SML Talk series can take take on a kind of a pop culture DNA. Because talking about design, talking about architecture doesn't have to be difficult and unenjoyable. I think it can be accessible and make understandable to the people uh, over a glass of beer, over a glass of wine. So in better times, I think that uh, hopefully we can hold these talks in a bar, in a club, and, uh, and we can all have our wine in hand and, uh, and Design Council has agreed to give me some pocket money to buy beer. So uh, we are, we're really looking forward to the day where Student SML Talk Series uh, can provide this platform for the community to come together uh, to share both uh, our sort of uh, stories and uh, hardships, issues, whatever, uh, so that the, the design community, community can grow and we can have a healthier uh, design ecosystem. And uh, okay, so lastly, um, I, I feel that this, uh, this project uh, for me personally, uh, has a certain sense of urgency because uh, I, I, I think hopefully I have a good 20 years to go. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how much time I have to document people, so I have to do it quite fast. Um, and uh, so I, I thank all of you who uh, agreed to come in the inaugural issue at SML. I thank Design Council uh, for supporting this project, for believing in it. And I hope that for the people who are listening to this, uh, this talk, uh, please come forth if you want to offer some kind of help because this is a completely self-initiated, self-funded project. Uh, I, it's, it's not for myself. I hope that uh, we can have this archive 20 years later. This will be so invaluable for the whole design community uh, as an education archive uh, and as a legacy for the design industry and for designers. So, uh, yes, so for those who are interested to, to you know, help uh, to, in this project, please uh, get in touch with me. Okay, so uh, that's uh, in a nutshell what Studio SML is about. Uh, I am now going to pass on to our first speaker of the day, uh, Gabriel Tan, who will share with us uh, about his practice. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to share with you today and, and thank you very much for Design Singapore and Studio SML for inviting. Um, actually, let me just share my screen here. So yeah, for, for, the, for those of you who may not know uh, what I do, um, currently based in Singapore and Portugal, uh, myself right now, I'm in Portugal. Uh, I moved here about a year ago to start a Portuguese studio. And um, my studio works in the field of uh, interior design uh, with the brand studio Antimatter, uh, furniture and lighting design with Cable Tan Studio and uh, Origin, which is a brand I started over here in Portugal, which focuses on craft uh, collaborations with uh, Portuguese craftsmen, but could also in the future involve uh, craftsmen of, of other countries. Yeah. So for Studio Antimatter, we, we do uh, interior design for, for both private clients and, and developers. Uh, right now, we are also moving into uh, some small hospitality uh, projects. Uh, so these are not, our approach generally to interior design is that we, we try to bespoke to design as much uh, as possible, the whole space, including the furniture and sometimes even the objects. Uh, so for example, for this Marina One show flat, uh, other than the lamp and the sofa uh, and the carpet, everything else was, was designed by us. The outdoor chair uh, was made in, in Singapore with a, with a metal work craftsman. Um, the, the wooden uh, console was made in, in Malaysia with, with one of the factories we know very well. And we actually made the, the coffee tables in Japan because we couldn't find a metal spinning in Singapore. So uh, we got a Japanese craftsman to, to make the coffee tables. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is another uh, penthouse interior that we did, uh, you know, with, with our objects from origin made in Portugal, um, chairs from Japan that, that we designed uh, for Ariake. Uh, so I would say when we work in spaces, we think very much about how uh, objects, furniture and space uh, combine harmoniously. Um, and we also try, if, if we do source for furniture, we, we try to bring in brands that are not available in Singapore, like 
like this uh, coffee table from Carl Anderson, which is a small uh, Swedish brand uh, that it's they don't export uh, very much uh, outside of, of Europe. Yeah. yeah, so here are some, some more images of recent interior works we have done. Um, and then a large part of my presentation will be talking about uh, furniture and my experiences with, with different cultures because I kind of view myself as a bit of a, a cultural nomad, uh, partly because I think in Singapore, currently we are going through like a bit of a craft renaissance. I mean, there are a lot of uh, urban craftsmen that are self-taught. Uh, but I, I think when, when I started getting into design like more than 10 years ago, uh, there was very little of this movement and I was very interested to explore craft cultures of, of different countries. So Furnishing Utopia is a project that I was involved in in, in the US. Uh, it started because I was teaching at the University of Oregon in 2012 and 2015 and one of my, my fellow professors was doing research into the Shakers. So I followed him uh, one, one winter after my, my teaching uh, stint ended to, to the Shaker villages in Hancock. Um, and I saw that uh, what they were doing there, I mean, they preserved all the, all the Shekhar artifacts uh, from the, the 19th century. So we could actually have access to all these beautiful uh, handmade furniture uh, by this utopian community that existed from the 1800s. Um, and this, I mean, for, for those of you who know the Shekhar's furniture influenced a lot of uh, contemporary furniture designers uh, from Bo Morgensen uh, in Denmark to, to Japanese uh, design as well. You can find shaker chairs even in Japan uh, being made today. And uh, we decided, uh, me and some American colleagues, uh, to, to start a project to gather a group of, of designers uh, from all over the world uh, to reinterpret shaker furniture and to create a kind of new uh, shaker movement or a new movement inspired by the shakers. So it was, a, it was a collective and we started to, to design new products uh, inspired by this philosophy of uh, beauty and utility uh, being going hand in hand. It's a bit different from like, you know, the Bauhaus or, or, or functionalism where instead of form follows function, uh, the Shakers believed in uh, making things both utilitarian and beautiful at the same time. Uh, that beauty was also in some way uh, uh, very important and for, for people who, you, who you know, basically build their own furniture and, and create uh, everything that they need uh, just for themselves, I think that was something very interesting. Yeah. And they believe in like worshipping. I mean, they were a Christian, um, Christian community, so they believed in worshipping by doing uh, good work with their hands, uh, praying by basically building furniture in the workshop, which uh, kind of blew my mind. I, I never thought you could pray by making furniture. But in some way, that was their, their, their ritual of, of making good things uh, with their hands and in that way, uh, honoring uh, God. Yeah. Myself, I'm not super religious, but uh, I saw it as something really poetic and beautiful. So they, they invented a lot of um, technologies as well, uh, cheese presses, uh, uh, butter presses, the flat broom. Uh, they claim to have invented it because before the brooms were, were cylindrical and they, they found that it was much more functional to press the brooms into into uh, a flat object so that you could use it to clean more easily. And we had, we had access to their archives uh, of like 300 over different designs. Uh, their chairs are the most well-known, but they, they created a lot of other things as well. And then these are the products that we designed uh, eventually, and we photographed them in the Shaker Village, and we exhibited them in, in New York, in Stockholm, in, in Chicago, uh, over a period of three years. Yeah, so these are some of the items I, I designed for this exhibition. Uh, a bench that is basically a, a kind of reinterpretation of the shaker bench, but with, uh, with some new details in joinery. Uh, a stool, a kind of carry stool with a handle uh, based on the idea of utility and, and mobility. Uh, a door stopper, um, which is now being produced by a German company, uh, Authentics. Uh, so it's, it's kind of inspired by some of their turn knobs of, of, their, of the objects that they use, uh, the kitchen objects, and how I felt that this was a very nice handle that you could use as a door stopper with a granite uh, base. And also like a bedside table with a hidden uh, secret compartment. So basically very simple utilitarian furniture, but with focus on the details um, was my interpretation of what 
uh, Shaker Furniture was, and I tried to bring that into my own work. Yeah. And uh, eventually, um, some of the pieces uh, ended up with, with brands uh, like this tool uh, for, for a Swedish brand, Blast Station, saw it in, in the Stockholm exhibition that we did uh, and decided to produce it. And this was like a basic, uh, a new take on the Shaker chair uh, where uh, you could hang this on the wall. It's a, it's a three legged stool chair uh, typology, it's super compact and super small. Uh, and this is photographed in the Shaker village. And the inspiration actually was from the Shaker stove that you see on the bottom left. So combining the idea of, of a stove, uh, using the shape to, to redesign it uh, for a new type of Shaker chair. Yeah. And uh, the other, the next project I'm talking about is, is something I started in Japan uh, called Ariake. Uh, so Ariake was is, is a project that uh, initiated because I met these two Japanese factories, uh, like Natec, uh, which is a company in Kyushu producing furniture. They have 50 employees. They were making furniture like these, uh, basically life edge uh, wooden slabs, uh, country style. I would say like modern country style Japanese furniture. Um, and then there was another company, Hirata Chair, which is the two founders are good friends. Uh, and this is the furniture that Hirata Chair makes. So they, they approached me with the view of designing some new products for them because they were exhibiting at the Singapore Furniture Fair and they wanted the collection that was targeted at the Singapore market. So I, I visited their factory in, in Kyushu in Southern Japan and uh, Saga Prefecture, which is like the ceramic uh, province. Um, and I realized that uh, they have very good craft. They have, you know, uh, five axis CNC machines, both technology and, and handwork. To, they have everything to, to be a, a very uh, progressive brand. But the, the thing that they lacked was, was design and, and designers. Uh, they were mainly designing everything in house or working with some uh, older uh, local Japanese designers, which, which was very relevant to the local market. But I felt that. Uh, Maybe they needed some some intervention to help them to internationalize, and I I advised them to instead of looking at just Singapore, uh, why not look at the world as a global marketplace? Because if you if you present your works, uh, you know in in Milan Fair or in Stockholm Fair, you will be able to reach the buyers, uh, in Singapore as well, um, and also be able to reach buyers in Tokyo because their products were not even selling uh, so much in in Tokyo or Osaka; they were mainly selling in the south. So I convinced them to, to do a bigger project. So they said, okay, like, could you work with, with our annual budget? We have a small annual budget. If you're willing to work with our small budget, uh, you can, what is the best way for it? And so I, I used the budget to, to invite uh, designers to, to come to Japan. Um, so the beginning, it was just uh, three designers I invited. Uh, Keiji Ashizawa, a Japanese architect from Tokyo. Uh, Anderson and Vol, which is a Norwegian design duo that I, I respect very much. And uh, Stefan Holm, a Swedish designer who used to be a, a trained carpenter. Um, and eventually we also invited norm architects from Denmark uh, and, and other designers to join the project. And, and we designed new furniture for them. But the interesting thing about this process was that we, we all went to Japan always at the same time, the designers uh, and myself as the creative director. Uh, Normally, I think when brands do product development, they invite the designers one by one uh, to their factories. But for me, I felt that there was an energy and, and, and synergy when everybody is there at the same time because we could all contribute to uh, looking at each other's designs, synchronizing them, making sure that whatever I design is not um, clashing with another designer's work. Um, and, you know, like this image pretty sums up the, the process where uh, one of the designers gets stuck and another designer will sketch a detail uh, to, to try to help the other designer out uh, wh while we are prototyping. So it was a, I mean, each designer was, uh, we all have our own clients, we all have our own body of work that, uh, but uh, at the same time, it was a very no ego process, you know, uh, helping each other out, sketching over each other's sketches. At the end, we signed the products under our own names, but then I would say there's always a little bit of Stefan or a little bit of KG or a little bit of uh, Norm in my work as well, because we were critiquing each other's work at the, at, at the same table. Not say critiquing, but more like uh, helping each other out in some way or the other. Yeah. So these are some of the, the prototypes we made while, while over there. Uh, and some of the photography that, that we did. 
and yeah, we, we also had a, a graphic designer and, and a photographer there uh, from Switzerland that, that I invited and they were working on the branding, the graphic design at the same time as us working on the product. So uh, when we went for the first workshop, actually the, the brand didn't even have a name yet. And we were voting for the name, we were voting for which was the best logo, the best brand color. So the product designers could also get involved with that together with the brand owners uh, instead of you know, the, the brand, basically the, the branding and corporate identity was built at the same time uh, as the products. And we made more, like mock-ups with MDFs, uh, with the help of the craftsmen, with plywood. Uh, and these are the eventual products. Uh, I mean, of course, we had to go through many rounds of prototyping even after the designers left Japan. But, you know, from the first prototype of this uh, to the final table, you can see that it was, it was not a very big difference. And having the one-is-to-one -one models within... Uh, one week uh, uh, really helped to speed up the, the process. And yeah, here's other like uh, images of rough models that were made during the, the one week workshop. Uh, you know, sketching over uh, with, with a marker, making changes, and eventually this is the, the final product. So I think the, as much as design is about, you know, uh, it, of course, a lot of it is working with computers, working with technology, but uh, this human interaction, you know, with the craftsmen, conversations, uh, being together in one place, uh, like what was Kelly uh, mentioning as well, you know, the, uh, is, the human interaction is really a large part of the process for me and bringing people together uh, to work on projects together is, is something I, I strongly believe in, which unfortunately was a bit lost during this pandemic where we had to do a lot of uh, product development uh, remotely. And yeah, these are some of the, the other products that were mock-ups and, and final products that were made. So I think Ariake was, was a very special brand in that sense because uh, as a Japanese brand, we, we tried to make it very progressive and very uh, forward-looking and not so conservative. Um, and we during the workshops, we, we also came up with uh, interesting finishing solutions such as using indigo dye, which normally uh, is not so widely used on wood furniture, <clears throat> to use it as part of the Arake uh, furniture palette. So we introduced indigo wood uh, instead of, you know, instead of the normal new Nordic uh, pastel colors that all the brands are using, we wanted to use colors uh, inspired by Japan. So uh, the black is actually from Sumi Ink. Uh, which is Japanese calligraphic ink. We use it to we use it to apply it on the furniture, and and indigo. So these were our, the two colors that we introduced: black and and blue, but using traditional Japanese dyes and materials. And eventually, the the collection we we showed it at Stockholm Design Week. Uh, so our strategy was to enter Scandinavia, um, as the first part of call, uh, because there is a lot of mutual respect uh, and aesthetics uh, sensibility shared between Scandinavia and Japan. So we showed the first year in, in Stockholm Design Week in an apartment that was basically due for renovation. And uh, we managed to get this space for almost nothing because uh, the, the owner was, was a friend of a mutual friend and we really didn't have budget to show in, in the trade fair. So we, we remove all the rubble and, and rubbish uh, from this uh, construction site and uh, we clean it out and we, we use it for, for an exhibition and it became kind of a sensation because it was like a private exhibition with no published uh, address on the internet. So only if you receive the email, you would, be, you would know the location of, of the show. And, uh, but in the end, we had, I would say, three or 400 people that, that managed to find this space and, and came to the event. And, uh, there were many, I mean, pictures are still being reposted today online uh, of, for this exhibition. And we named the exhibition a, a Quiet Reflection. And yeah, it wouldn't have been possible without some very passionate collaborators like, like Hannah Nova, which was the, the editor of Residence Magazine at that time, because uh, she heard that we were looking for a, a location and we, we didn't have much budget, but she really liked the brand. Uh, so she, she offered to help uh, connect us with, with the owner of this apartment that she knew was, was really not, not using the apartment. And uh, subsequently, the next year, we showed in another venue, the, a bigger venue, which was a, a church. 
So this was like a, a church right in the middle of the city in Stockholm uh, for the African uh, immigrant community. So it was also a church that not many local people have visited. Uh, they were doing like um, gospel singing, like Harlem style type of gospel singing. And, you know, um, they have also uh, so-called homeless dinners being, uh, this is what this space is normally used for where, where they serve uh, the homeless people the, the food. And we, we went to ask them if we could rent this space for a design exhibition. And uh, they were a bit shocked at first that, that uh, somebody wanted to do this in, in this space, but it was really historic and beautiful space. And, and um, we had also a very, a very good show there with, with lots of good images. And then in the third year, uh, where the brand finally, I would say we, we grew up, we, we had a bit more bigger budgets now, and we, we rented a national archive uh, for the exhibition, which is a well-known uh, well building in Stockholm. It used to be the, the National Archive where they keep all the records of the citizens. Um, and now it's used as a kind of a wedding space or event space. And uh, it was like 500 square meters. Um, and yeah, we, we did our last exhibition here right before the pandemic uh, in February of last year. So yeah, I mean, watching this brand grow uh, over the last uh, four years uh, has been a pretty amazing journey for myself. I also grew along with the brand, I would say my confidence uh, in dealing with, with well-known designers and also dealing with retailers, dealing with distributors, uh, getting to know every part of the, the industry. And yeah, the, the last two projects I'm talking about is a Turn is, is a door handle company, is a startup company from Singapore uh, that I helped to, to uh, creative direct and to invite designers to join. Uh, so was, they developed this uh, slow rebound technology uh, that is the first in the world where you actually depress the lever door handle and it rebounds uh, silently and slowly. So I invited different designers to contribute uh, to, their, to, their, um, to their portfolio. So it's not just about the technology, but also about a sculptural and minimal door handle. And uh, this brand is, Right now, in, in still in prototyping stages, but they're about to launch, uh, I would say in the next six months, the products will be ready for, for sale. And we got good designers, like uh, good architects like MK27 and uh, uh, Snohetta to design door handles for them. And uh, surprisingly, it was not so difficult to get them to agree because I think for, for architects or designers, when you have a uh, interesting technology behind it. It doesn't really matter whether you are a startup or a known company, uh, but if they see the potential in it, I think people would invest their, their time uh, to design products for it. Uh, and then after I moved to, actually this started, this project started when I was in the process of moving to Portugal. Uh, yeah, so this is a cork acoustic panels made in Portugal uh, that using recycled wine stoppers. Uh, which is now produced by the Swedish brand Abstracta. So I connected them with, with this uh, factory that is doing injection molded of cork. Uh, and the three of us collaborated to, to make this product. Uh, and the last project is my, my own brand that I started here, Origin, um, which working with local craftsmen, we, we started a brand here that is uh, inviting international designers, myself designing some of the pieces, but also uh, working with international uh, designers that I know uh, to each work with different craftsmen to create contemporary objects using a traditional Portuguese craft. So these are the pieces that I designed uh, with a black uh, terracotta from Portugal, a very traditional technique over here, um, and using it to reinterpret what is the, the shape of a vase or challenging what is the archetype of, of a vase, yeah. And we give a lot of attention to the craftsmen in our branding and in our catalogs uh, because we feel that sometimes the designer is being over promoted. Uh, so we want to promote the craftsman instead and or for each product, there is both the name of the designer as well as the craftsman. Uh, so it's kind of shared credits because without the craftsman, the, the products can never be, be realized yet. And these are some, basically some images of, of all the products uh, shot together. Yeah, and that's that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you, uh, thank you for the time, and yeah.
Thank you so much, Gabriel, for your sharing. So now let us welcome Jessica Wong and Pamela Ting, co-founders of Xinxiang on screen, please. Hello. Hi. Can you see us? Okay. Uh, okay, so we're from Xinxiang, and um, Xinxiang actually is a play on the word Xinxiang in Chinese. So uh, appreciation, it means, but we also play on the Chinese word new appreciation. And the essence of the brand is really to um, be inspired by culture, tradition, um, heritage, and adding our own design language and interpretation in a contemporary way. So we find that a lot of um, uh, Chinese furniture, well, I say Chinese because we are ethnically Chinese, but of course Asia encompasses a lot, uh, a lot larger uh, in terms of race and cultures and everything, but we start from from you know um, the Chinese culture because we're both Chinese and I think that um, when we look at furniture from from the Chinese culture, it's usually large and quite um, intimidating. So what we try to do um, at Xin China is to to add our own voice to it that is you know a lot more contemporary and modern. And being from Singapore, um, it also forces us to be a lot more efficient in the use of space. Um, and also, you know, like changing homes and everything, which, are, which we'll talk about later. Uh, so a little bit about our background. We met in JC, which is like half our lives away. Um, and I think back then we were not so close until we both did an internship in university uh, in uh, Shanghai. And Shanghai was very inspiring for us because it had the melting of the East and West and also the old and the new. And um, I think it made us question our identity as Singaporeans, as Chinese Singaporeans, and what it meant um, to, to have this culture. And a lot of the culture that we learn in our homes uh, is very diluted from you know, our ancestors who, who, who came from China. So some of the things we recognize, some we didn't, and I think that made us very curious to understand like emblems, symbols, um, shapes and everything uh, in design. So we shared a flat together and then you know along the way we started buying pieces of furniture, uh, decking up the space and I think that kind of led us into um, starting Xinxiang. We came back in 2014. Okay. <laughs> no, we came back quite early on but we, we both uh, went on to do our own uh, I mean, I, I did interior and graphic design and Pam worked in a bank. Mm -hmm. And I think that we always felt this calling uh, to address some that, that, that interest that was piqued uh, when we went to Shanghai. And I think after five years of uh, working in our respective jobs, we decided to step out and create this own brand uh, to design the homeware and furniture. So uh, actually, yeah, my background is actually in architecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we thought that, okay, what can we use these experiences to create a unique selling point uh, to take our stories and our stories which were also similar to what we saw that people around us wanted. Like, for example, my interior design clients, they were seeking for pieces of furniture that uh, reference like our cultural heritage, but yet had a contemporary touch to it. So I think that was why we wanted to create a brand. And here we are today um, from a the two, I mean, the two from just the two of us in a small uh, space, in a small uh, room. Yeah, I mean, we started in a room in Shanghai, right? And like, we were literally like spraying things, filing things until, you know, got a bit of like green problems. But anyway, <laughs> uh, two of us in a room in Shanghai. And then um, after that, when we moved back to Singapore, we shared an office at Institution Hill with another design studio. Um, and then slowly we moved on to our um, space in, in Chai Chi, which was a little bit bigger. And then now we just moved to our new space, which is 6,000 square feet. So I guess the progression of it over the last seven years, seven. six, seven years, um, is quite, I mean, I won't say it was very exponential, but um, you can see that, you know, it's, it's baby steps. Huh? And um, of course, there were a lot of, um, you know, like challenges, challenges and all that kind of way. Uh, yeah, we can move to the next slide. Um, yeah, so I think um, at the end of the day, we really want to design pieces that speak to each individual. And I find that, you know, the stories and um, the experiences we have culturally cannot be too different because, you know, we're all here in um, Singapore, in 
Asia. And some of these elements that we picked out, for example, um, you know, like listening to grandma in her, in her armchair, sitting on a rocking stool, uh, having dinner on a marble table, like all these are nostalgic elements that we want to, you know, inject into the, the pieces that we create without it looking too like it was designed like many, many yeah, years Yeah, correct. And you know, we don't want it to look too different from the rest of the modern pieces that we have at home. But like, oh, this one is from British era. Like, like, you know, we want it to speak of the 21st century and to, to say something of the place that we're in, which is Singapore, that, you know, has that mix as well, the East and West and everything. So I guess that is still the, the ethos and essence that we come from in everything that we design uh, and we put forth, um, and even the collaborations that we do with other people. Yeah, okay, next slide. Okay. okay, so I think we already briefly shared um, uh, about the brand. So I think these are just the three key points that uh, we always come back to to remind us why uh, why we are seeing Shang and why we start seeing Shang. So uh, the first one would just be that our homes are changing, like the spaces we live in are different. The people, I mean, the, the family sizes and all that, the way we use the space is also different. Uh, maybe to illustrate on the next slide. Okay, for example, like you can see homes getting smaller, we see a dual, uh, people wanting um, more users for a piece of furniture. So for example, this was actually uh, an interior design project that I did way before Xinjiang, and I already found that people wanted to have uh, flexibility in the furniture and modularity to address the different space. Uh, and when, for example, like this was actually designed for a home for a mother and doctor. Uh, I mean, the doctor is an adult working uh, lady, and um, just, just the two of them would be having dinner at home, but they would also have guests come over on birthdays, uh, Chinese New Year, Christmas, whatever, and they would require the space to allow dining for more people. So we uh, actually designed this like, study table to become a, a, a modular piece that could join with the dining table. Uh, so we found that people yeah, wanted this flexibility. Uh, so the next point, um, yeah, can we move to the next slide? Yeah. yeah, so we don't stay in the same house. I mean, I don't know how many of you have actually stayed in the, in the house that you were born into, but um, my experience is I've moved more than 20 times in my life, right? And I'm not super old. So, um, yeah, and I think it's because, you know, we, we just need, I don't know, it's just a you know, change of space, environment. We can see the next slide. And, um, you know, you move from your parents' place and then maybe you get married, you move to a different place and then you have children, you know, a bigger space. So, like, we don't stay in the same house for 10, more than 10 years and therefore, like, the furniture that we design is conscious of that. Yeah, the what what happens to the furniture, like, when you move home, you know, like, mm. uh, is it too big to bring along or, or yeah, what happens? Do you throw it away? Do you leave it away? I mean, those are just questions you wanted to address in our designs. Mm. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was personal experience when we moved to Shanghai, we were like, Oh my god, so many things to, to pack and like where what did we do with all this furniture? If only we could literally have them in modular um, um, pieces and bring them with us as well because they're sentimental. So um, yeah, okay, next slide. So the third one is the layer of culture. Uh, I think at home, the home is where we first learn about culture, like as Pam said, like nobody listen to the stories from your from your grandparents, from your parents. Uh, and all that, and we find that this uh, to us especially is that this piece of culture is very important in defining ourselves and makes us who we are. So let's go on to the next slide. Yeah. So yeah, like the stories, the food we eat, uh, and how that like, furniture and where comes into this world uh, where we learn about ourselves at home. Mm -hmm. So uh, next slide, please. So one of the first pieces that we designed was the Shang system which is a three-part system. So there's the pan, which is the top tray, the her, which is the drawer, and then the teng, which is the stool. And we made this basically conscious of the fact that you know, we, wanted it, we wanted it modular so that you can continue to add um, boxes as you wish, in colors that you wish, and you can take them apart as a win. Also, the elements of you know, Asian and Chinese, it's, it's um, in little things like the eaves and um, the ears of the pan. So you can make it as Chinese as you want and you can make it as modern as you want. And I think that encapsulates what we stand for as a brand um, to still have the culture, the cultural element in it, but um, allowing you know others to personalize it. Yeah. The next. 
So the next piece also is something like a bit more uh, uh, a more fun object because we did a project and we spoke with people to ask them what uh, kind what would make them want to keep a piece of furniture forever and we knew that um, from the stories is that through their interactions uh, and we also uncovered that uh, possibly that you, when you interact with something like uh, and you form that, re that relationship as a child, that was a very strong emotional response that could make you want to keep a piece of furniture together. So we, uh, so we wanted to capture that, that experience of um, having an approachable piece yeah. of furniture, mm -hmm. that something's not scary. Like for example, just now Pam mentioned about like traditional furniture being like big and bulky and scary. It could be scary. We, we spoke with someone, Audrey, and she said that like she was very scared of all parents' antique furniture and all that, although they were so beautiful. But the piece that she loved was something that she could play with. Uh, it had uh, it was a wash basin stand and it was just the right height for a child to, to play and make believe. And we wanted to create uh, that in our furniture design. So as I always tell people, like I love it, like when I see this piece, um, when I see people come up to this piece of furniture, the sloppy stool, um, you see people come come to sit on it like a like a rocking horse, or they could sit on it like a normal chair, those who are a bit more uh, not uh, maybe a bit more shy. And then I even had like this grandfather who came into a store and he went lie on the rocking stool on his stomach and he flew like a superman. He told his grandson like um, hey, this is how you sit on it. So I think like we want to create the element of like you know interaction and fun and like emotional bonds with the furniture. So uh, bringing on to the last piece. Uh, so the last piece, this one was our most uh, recent uh, award uh, winner, which is the Shen Cable. Uh, I think for this piece, uh, it's actually, you could go to our website and find out more information to see uh, the photos or videos. But basically this is made, uh, it's a folding cable uh, because we were, we were thinking about like, what is the center of a home in, in, in a lot of homes, I mean, there's always this like folding table that could be used for a lot uh, of different things like play manjong, manjong, uh, food, uh, study, I don't know, like maybe some women would have to work from home from the foldable table now. So we wanted to create this really beautiful piece that uh, this piece is currently actually entirely handcrafted in Singapore also because of, of like some COVID concerns and, all, and you can't really travel as much anymore. And um, yeah, so this piece can fold to a console. It still looks beautiful. You still want to put it in your house. Uh, you can fold down one flap and it becomes a triangle. So you can have a three person mahjong game or like put it in a corner or you could open it up fully. But I think we just really wanted to celebrate like the people that we work with. I think this is made, uh, this is made with a guy who's like in his 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has a lot of experience and all that. Um, I mean, Initially, when we started, he would be the kind who would be a bit reluctant to work with you because he still didn't know you were proven yet. But I, I think we're so happy nowadays. When, like whenever we go and uh, pick up the pieces, he's like, uh, this piece is really very beautiful. You know, like uh, my name is asking me to sell it to him, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's so it's so it's so great to hear yeah, that even the craft person who's making it like loves the design. So yeah, I think that's what we have to share. Uh, I mean, yeah, so if you're interested, you can find out more on the website. Yeah. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jessica and Pamela. Let Thank us you. now welcome Randy Chan, principal architect and founder of Zark Collaborative. Screen, please. Hi. Hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kelly and uh, Design Singapore. And uh, Felicia, um, thank you for, you're going to flash a slide for me. Yeah. So I shall begin in Hokkien, uh, how to tan jia in uh, Singapore. That is the value proposition. I guess uh, uh, in today's session, uh, for those who, not, who doesn't understand Hokkien, uh, Tan Chia is how to survive. And I think today I just present uh, just a, a part of me, right? Uh, which is very much, uh, uh, I mean, you saw on the, on the left side. Anyway, this was uh, part of the Singapore Architects uh, Journal, uh, Artist, Architect, cur Curator. So um, it's a kind of three in one and, and, and today, the value proposition, I guess, um, uh, in the light of post-COVID and also the fact that we have the 20 uh, September 11 um, uh, anniversary of this uh, World Trade Center, right? Um, the practice actually was born out in 2001. So the question here was really, um, as I reflect, right? Next slide, please. Um, the question here was really about um, how 
when do we really start the practice? Is it in good time or bad times? And, and, and in the series of slides, I just want to illustrate that really um, uh, it has been a journey for me in terms of um, how it has evolved and, and in terms of as a belief, in terms of um, uh, what design is, uh, it has been a learning journey. And, and as we speak, of course, what is this post-COVID uh, um, scenario that's painted? Uh, today will not be the topic, but it was more in terms of what is what has been uh, the last 20 years for me. Next. So uh, you picture this is that uh, this was actually um, a presentation that we, we likened the fact that uh, we jump from room to room, uh, okay? Almost like a butterfly, but I just likened my practice to a Zizha store, right? You, 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 you actually can cook many things, whether you are, you know, a chicken rice and specialize and be good at it, or you can actually, you know, um, I'll have many dishes. Lah. So I always tell them that uh, my practice, you know, as a multidisciplinary firm, uh, which is very much how the world has uh, kind of panned out, luckily. Um, back then, 20 years ago, um, uh, I would say an architect, um, the, the whole scene wasn't uh, that, that close. Um, the scene in the, in, the, in the late 90s for Singapore was really, uh, it's still a formative year. And thank God, uh, I would say that uh, uh, design is converging and I'm glad that we were in the right place at the right time. And this is really illustrate how as a mind map, how we, uh, I see the world uh, in terms of um, uh, as much as it's framed within the boxes. Next. And I just wanted to share that bit of that common memory um, for those who are uh, born, I mean, uh, who happen to, to be into this building night and day. Uh, one of the common things that when we have a practice, right, after some time in Singapore is that you, 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 we always tend to say that it's boring, is um, we don't have a culture of design and so on and so forth. So um, um, just want to share that uh, this was where um, I would say that uh, it's one of the very key milestones to the practice of Zach. Um, this is actually at Seligi Road. Uh, it is, uh, uh, we occupied the whole entire floor and Kelly was actually at the upper floor. We felt that if, you know, we are practicing in Singapore, if, if the scene is so dead, flat, boring, right? Um, one of the things about the practices was that you want to be bounty disciplinary. You want to effect a change in terms of um, how the design scene is. At the same time, you're running a business. So how do you do that? Next, please. So we thought that, huh, we must have collaboration, okay? So what does it mean? So um, again, uh, I, I, I better lend accreditation. Uh, this is also, uh, uh, the time where Kelly is um, the SA um, uh, editor. Collaboration was kind of important. Um, um, whatever that means, uh, I shall illustrate it in, 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 the, in the later part of, of, of some of the projects. Next. And we thought that, huh, we must have a bar to practice, to survive, to tanjia, to know people. What's a better way to have uh, a bar, we attract all the creative to come. So we have a bar at this second level and going up the staircase, you can see the graffiti, right? It, it, it can't reach the middle kingdom. Like, that's where Zach is. And then Kelly is right at the top where we also have, next please. We have a gallery and, and this gallery actually were home to the illustrative art. So we thought that uh, in a practice in Singapore, right, I think one of the key things was, that was very formative was we are so small, by right, we should know everybody, right? But we often, we often are in silos because maybe perhaps design is kind of a secretive thing. We, we, we need to kind of, you know, be away from everybody and do our own work. Um, so the idea of collaboration, the idea of creating a space for that, I think was a very important ingredient to say, to come back to this value proposition, how to survive as a small practice. You need a community. I think that is very important for me. And in fact, it was a seven years project. It was a very fulfilling project. Of course, you have many booths. You have also meet many creative from other fields, not just architects. I mean, we have 
uh, wonderful uh, sessions, you know, uh, whether it's uh, illustrative art, whether it's graphic artists, whether you have stand-up comedy, whether you have uh, sound artists, we have it all. And it was one of the coolest place that this is where I felt that um, trickling down, um, uh, one of the ingredients I really felt is really if, if it, it's about this space that we have to make a point to create. I think it's very important important. Uh, we often lament about the rigidity, but it is how you actually look at it. Next, please. And yeah, we, we even explore, yeah, the space is flat, you know, and, and what, what, what do you do? And, and how do we go about it, right? Tabula rasa, right? But I think there is beauty in this little uh, country of ours, a city-state, an island city-state. I think we are conditioned by, by, by the fact of, we often say it's a short history and if we personify it, we are like a rich little poor girl, you know, if there's a description of, of personifying our country, rich little poor girl in that sense. And, and it is this, this paradox that, that, that um, a practice, any practice that practice in Singapore will understand that um, there is a legality of the of the, the rule of law that is strong, which we operate in. There is also the stir round, you know, aspect that we often lament, say, how come we come, come be a bit more daring and, and, and things like that. But of course the scene has changed dramatically. We are more confident. The space is not flat anymore, uh, which are happy. I mean, based on um, the trajectory that we have been so far. Next. And the subsequent slide is not about just about the work that I do, but it's just a sampling about, we are conditioned um, by the fact that because of, of the construct of this country, this country as whether you call it a, a, a garden city, city in a garden and, so, and, and, and the fact that uh, it's more known as a business city and as, as an overachiever in this part of the, 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 the region itself, um, we need to be proud. And, and this, this YOG, I think in terms of uh, the Youth Olympics, uh, we, we were one of the scenographer. Um, in some of the works, you can see that uh, um, uh, there is this whole tie up to the whole ideology of, of being here, practicing here. We need to be able to understand the narrative. I think the operative here is really, we, whether it's urbanism, whether it is about an accidentalist question about um, um, what is a Singapore design, uh, what is Singapore as a place. Um, I think it's important. It's not just an architectural question. I think it lies in, especially acutely, uh, all of us have went, I mean, where we are in this pandemic, as we're going to the endemic, um, it has reinforced a collective memory. And I think hosting and, and um, um, a project like this, right? Um, of course, it's a pride for Singapore because the stage is in Singapore, but the show is to the world. And I think that is what the last two speakers, I mean, uh, Gabriel, uh, um, um, have shown. And, and I'm really, really happy that this has been, been, been the case. And I think it's about how, how we can practice it with, uh, with, with, with the kind of... Um, of, of where we come from, you know, how much material, you know, do we actually derive when we do the work? As you can see from um, um, some of this. Next, I'll just quickly go by. And of course, um, when I talk about, about some of the trajectory as I move on, um, they are important chapters to Suzak, but at the same time, I mean relevance as a relevant to the studio in terms of how it survived. This was a project, of course, uh, close to my heart substation. We all know it, is a, it has been, it is close. And um, this project, um, uh, it was a 20 year anniversary. And, and, and I guess um, when I say relevance, right, I felt that as a practice in Singapore, uh, it is important and be proud in, in, in some ways that we, we are always inspired by, by the condition of where we live and also the narrative here as a first um, contemporary art um, institution in Singapore. It was erect, I mean, it was built um, uh, um, by in, in 1990, 
92, uh, Kuo Pao Kun is, 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 is the theatre donia that, that, that have actually bring this. It has brought along all a new generation of artists and, 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 and all the creative. It was the place at that time. And I guess the relevance has lost and, and it has to evolve. It is just like the night and day, it is a project. So in, as a studio practice, I guess uh, it is important to know the narrative. What is our narrative uh, in, when we respond to a particular work? Next. And so is this. Where you are right now, um, you can make a guess. This is Bidadari. It's a 12th time oversubscribed HDB as we speak. It is all fully built. This was um, a project that lament about even the dead, the dead are disturbed. This was in the heightened time of 2015, where um, Bukit Brown is, uh, has been the, 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 the the, you know, they try to bulldoze, uh, um, bulldoze uh, expressway uh, across. And Bidadari is also one of the victims itself. I, I felt that it was important to have a, a stage to play to the goals of, of to nobody. And uh, this was just a, a, a way to respond to the loss. And one of the key thing about, in the practice, I also wanted to say was, again, this condition about being young, tabula rasa, being small, working out the space, uh, it's also about this amplification in a practice. It is important to not just physically practice internationally, but it's also trying to grapple because our value system is very different in terms of where we live, our worldview about space, the concept of space is, is kind of different because we, we are really living in a, in a, in a very urbanistic, um, densely urbanistic city itself. We rarely call ourselves, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's one per 8,000 per, 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 per square kilometer is, is really a dense place to live in. And how do we dealt with uh, the condition of, of changes? So in the practice, I felt it is important. Next. And of course, uh, uh, this is, of course, a bit surreal. Of course, it marked a, a chapter in terms of this is an installation in, in National Gallery. Um, I have a twin at the late age of 47. Uh, I felt that it was important. So I guess um, as a designer, as a practice um, uh, between, say, how do we operate in terms of Singapore, I guess is to, of course, understand the narrative, just like, if Gabriel is in, in Portugal, he got to understand why he is in Portugal. And I think that sharing was, uh, was, was very much a poignant one for me because it kind of relates in terms of, in terms of a craft. Um, what is our narrative? I think to survive is to also to understand where we come from. Next. And of course, a bicentennial, we... I felt cheated when I was told to do this project. Um, I, I was a convert. I didn't know Singapore history is 500, 500 years, dated to 14th century. Um, this was one of, uh, I mean, this was a bicentennial uh, pathfinder. Uh, it was um, a kind of installation structure. So same thing, there were, I think along the course of, 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 of this studio, um, the formative aspect about what does, it mean to, to survive perhaps is also um, a, a, a subtext to say, um, uh, who are you? What is meant to be a Singaporean uh, practicing in today's world, in Singapore perhaps? Next. And, and um, this is uh, just one of the installation work that, that is in Juchet. If it is the last day on this earth, what would you bring back with you? Next. Uh, next, uh, this is in Palais de Tokyo, and, and of course, uh, last but not least, there was also the traveling show where, where there was a, a newfound confidence, uh, that, uh, a traveling show that went to London, Beijing, New York, uh, which we kind of showcased over 97 uh, creative. Um, it was an important seminar work because this is where we are in terms of um, how um, local Singaporeans have, uh, have, have able to go far and wide. The last three slides next is, of course, as architectural, um, uh, I just want to just say quickly, um, next, 
This is Jacob Balas, and this is in Jurong Lake. Next. Of course, uh, this is Len Villa. I just want to say that uh, uh, all this work uh, are plugged into, of course, uh, a newer narrative about what is meant to be living in, 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 in the city. Of course, the narrative here is a uh, city in the garden. And, 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 and what really, um, as a summary to what it is, 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 is that relevance uh, as, we, as we talk about the, 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 the kind of practice that we want. Yeah, with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Randy. So last but not least, let us welcome Boon Yang, co-founder of EcoAid Architects on Screen, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, really nice to have you guys spend time this podcast. Uh, so when I met Kelly and she invited me to join in this collaborative effort, uh, one theme that she reminded us was how us designers never got this management training, right, in school. We also focused on this studio effect, how to focus on our creative craft. And uh, my God, I mean, one big chunk of being able to even do our craft is how you make a business and pay the rent, pay yourself, pay people to work for you. And that's something that... Uh, I would like to touch on briefly and maybe there'll be more questions later. So with that, I'll start a short slideshow and talk you through and share how we started. Right, so as always, you know, um, we started in 1995, so we are a pretty old firm and we are, I'm kind of what, fourth gen as you call it. Uh, and, and as always, the people you work with, right, the plans you choose is an important uh, and sometimes a bit of a luck withdrawal, whether your partners work out or not. And we've survived together for, you know, 20 over years in practice. And the reality is that it's never the same, right? It's, uh, you know, even yourself changes with time, your partners and the way they think will change. And the adaptability is something to do with just managing communications uh, um, with your peers, with your team, with your, with your staff. Um, and that's something that's, an important idea to, to think about. Uh, what's interesting is that I didn't start by being an architect. I wanted to be a travel journalist. I wanted to be a doctor before I switched to, to architecture. So in some ways, you know, architects tend to be dabbling in many things. And I think if you have many interests, I think it's good for, for what we do. Um, this is our studio. So. Uh, I, I'm sad to say we grew very large at one point and we're down to about 60 people now and we've got a few offices, one in Singapore, Bangkok, Shanghai. Um, and, and I'll share with you the pros and cons of growing the team and so on and managing it. So we have a nice workspace now. Everybody likes it. We have a lot of parties here. So the, the physical setting for a studio and the... Uh, as a place for social interaction is very important. So when we build our new studios, half the time is actually interaction at work, but also socially, uh, kind of a glue that gets, gets us all discussing and thinking. So we have a lot of parties there and really our staff grew and shrunk. And, and it's, it's all the key part in how we manage the practice, right? Because staffing is forever very expensive, very difficult to deal with. But uh, it's part and parcel of the foundation of what projects we do, the larger ones especially. I mean, this is huge. Uh, we just finished a couple of very large, tall buildings. Uh, things take, what, four, five, six years. So to do these projects, right, you have to hire people. You have to make sure that we're able to keep the project going for five, six years. Now, can you imagine when you get a job and you get a fee, you try to keep it competitive, right? And you've got inflation that runs for four to five years. You never think of that, right? Uh, and very often towards the end, they don't pay you on time. Inflation goes up. The cost of employment goes up. You are losing money, right? So this is one of the things that uh, over time, you really learn how to deal with some of these uh, uh, nuts and bolts of, uh, of running the the business of design. Of course, we do large things, but my love is still going back to small things. You know, we do homes, we do 
private houses, we do residential projects. So um, we do very modernist urban residences. These require time again, right? You know, these things takes two and a half years. Uh, so initially you think that you can hire more people and then have them do the work. No, I mean, when, it, when a client pays you a good fee, he wants your time, you know, weekday, weekends, right? So there's no end to it. And if you're traveling, they get upset. So managing expectation uh, to be able to deliver on this project, it's in itself a, a, a little minefield to, uh, to have to navigate. We do projects in quite a lot of uh, the other parts of the world. Uh, we do quite a lot of projects in the mountains and uh, by the sea. So these type of projects are quite unusual, right? Because we deal with the government, we, we build a, a ski resort, we build a visitor center. It requires a different skill set that a lot of our staff never even deal with. Uh, terrain maps, for example. Uh, half the time we are hand sketching to get something uh, done, right? So again, uh, the skill set of people we have in the team, how we deal with clients, you know, uh, you can't just apply a Singaporean uh, outlook to doing some of these type of projects. You have to be fairly international and local all at the same time. Um, so this would be a kind of a medium project. Then we do a lot of these projects um, in Maldives, in Indonesia, in Bali, where we do whole island, you know, and, and these are projects four to five years, we work with operators, we work with all sorts of difficult constructional situation. Uh, and, and in itself, managing that process is, is quite an interesting um, and it's almost very rewarding uh, kind of journey, right? So in this project, which is in the um, South China Sea, you get there by seaplane. Uh, in this project, we built everything from bamboo. So even though we're, we're, we're urbanists and so on, in certain contexts, in this case, we chose to uh, have every bit of a structure built of bamboo. We had it farmed, and you know, we bought farmed bamboo. Uh, there's no engineer who can submit it, so we went to an engineer in Bandung to build a mock-up uh, and figure out how to get bamboo to work in, in sort of uh, hurricane winds, right? Because you have your monsoons coming in, so it has to perform. It wasn't just a nice little beautiful thing, but it has to weather the, the storms coming in as well. Um, again, project like this is both modern and traditional. It was built by hand um, and, and it means that uh, our team skill set that needed to design and draw this means that we have to hand draw and hand sketch more than we do a cat drawing, for example, because it is down to a guy, a woodworker sawing and chiseling um, on site, you know, and, and the wood is whatever they can find, for example. Uh, it, this was actually mocked up. The, the structure was so novel, and the engineer wanted to have a, a full mock up done in, uh, off the university ground. So we had to put up a full mock up and dismantle it and reuse it. And then, obviously, when you put up a full mock up from a hand mock up to full mock up, it required uh, a lot of uh, modification and, and um, on site adjustments to make it work. Um, and in the end, it was put up very quickly because of this process, right? So this is very left field for us, for me as well in a sense that, uh, you know, it, it's a beautiful craft project, right, or GCB or something else, or something too modern, right? It's a combination of craft and geometry, uh, very difficult site terrain, and, and the limits of executing it by teams of people who are used to traits that they are used to. They can't simply make something that uh, you draw uh, on a computer. I think. And this type of work takes us into craft, right? So uh, when they needed, the lamb's done. I just sketched it. Uh, a village in Java made a mock up. We approved it. And then uh, a few months later, it is put up, you know. So this is the art part of this type of project. And, and this is actually very satisfying. In some ways, I find that over time, I gravitate back to these new type of projects where it breaks new ground for me, for us, you know, uh, and, and uh, it brings a lot of uh, enjoyment to the team, even though it is not easy. It's not conventional at all. So I want to share that really underpinning this whole thing, you know, the things you saw, what we do, and how we grew from two person in the Geylang basement to our practice size now, is management uh, that we never learned in school. And it's something you learn along the way, and, and you make a lot of mistakes. You lose money <laughs> in the earlier years. 
And uh, all this translate into a few things that I think every young designer really ought to pay some attention to and try to learn from mentor if possible, right? Um, and they translate into many overlapping things, right? How do you get a job and a client who comes in? Uh, how do you negotiate for the right fee that, you know, that will pay? Uh, how do you collect money in time so that your cash flow comes in monthly, that's enough to pay people? How do you project cash flow? Uh, your people then has to execute the design with the man hours allocated. And the design then has to satisfy the client. So this whole overlapping, circular, confusing diagram is something that uh, differs from practice to practice. It differs from people's uh, uh, kind of uh, way of organizing themselves. But in it, a few pillars never change, right? Uh, and I think the first one is really communication and design in the sense that it is through your ability to uh, have a fundamental design, love and signature that people then come to you, number one, right? Then you, when you deal with clients, your, your skill in communication is not simply getting a job, but actually communicating design to clients and to your audience. I am afraid to say that very often, uh, lots of people are unable to communicate design effectively. You think it's just about design, but it's not. You know, it is about uh, the business idea of the design, right? If you do a chair or a house or a building, uh, a client has got their own agenda. You know, it's going to be nice, but it's going to be affordable. It has to work. And I think that's something that uh, uh, we as designers really have to be very sharp on, on, on understanding, you see. Uh, and, and then navigating that and getting that, that fee contract in and, and for you to pay for time is something that I think we all must learn faster than, than later. You know, uh, when we're very... Uh, uh, young, we think, oh God, you know, uh, if we do, do our design job well, people will love us and you pay us. It just doesn't happen. People just, just hate to pay money, right? <laughs> it's so hard to get money out of people's hands, you see. So I think being very blunt in negotiating contracts and just knowing what you're worth, okay? Uh, someone paying for your time, not doing a free job, right? It's a fundamental thing you must start on day one. If you don't, you find that you're always trying to please everybody. And I think that's um, something that we have to wean ourselves away from as soon as possible, right? Because if you have the attitude and your work is good, people will pay for that time. And, and that is going to pay for you to grow, to, to be able to uh, uh, staff the office and the infrastructure properly to then do good work. And for you to grow to a size where you're happy to, to do your type of, of craft well, see. Um, yeah, so, so I think uh, uh, in my mind, these few key things about management that we learn uh, um, is something that we learn the hard way and, and I very often we try to impart this to young people I meet, to my staff, to young people who join us for as, as interns. Um, you know, our, our office grew to 100 plus at one point. Uh, it was not nice. I, I will share with you that growing for size, uh, 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 to size just because of more work is not the way to go, right? Uh, COVID has taught me to be very productive uh, the people we have now are very focused yeah. um, and, and uh, they don't move around so much. Uh, they do things that were paid for on time. Uh, when clients don't pay us, we just stop the work and we just don't do it, right? And over time, we realize that you get some respect that way. They, they, they pay people who chase more, right? And I find that uh, now we're in a happier spot where I do my work happily. Um, you know, clients respect us, you get paid on time or more on time than in the past, right? Um, and, and that's a message I want to sort of share with, with the younger designers who are established or starting out that uh, pay attention to this concept of man hours, right? So uh, I'll share with you how we generate a fee proposal. It is always cost of our time, right? People you hire, uh, that you're trying to pay a better salary to yourself, for example, you have to be very smart about what it takes to do that work and how many hours and the hours translate into a dollar and then that is added up to become the fee. Uh, it also means that you have to be very efficient in the design process. It's so damn competitive. I would say that in the 90s, right, our architectural fee is at least 30, 40 percent higher than it is now, right? I would say that generally speaking, it is far more competitive out there to 
to bid for a job, you know, uh, compared to 15 years ago. Uh, the work is harder to do, kinds of more demanding, authorities are more difficult. Uh, so if you're not careful with process, uh, you will find that you cannot sustain your work. And if you can't sustain your work, you can't do what you love, which is to design. Yeah. So my simple message is really value your craft and your time. Uh, try to pay attention to the business side of it, which is actually managing clients, managing uh, the finances, uh, because all that feeds into creating a sustainable platform for you to do what you love to do, which is to design and, and to produce nice work. Right, thank you. That's my little short uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Bunyang. We would now like to invite all the speakers to join us on screen for the Q&A segment. We are running a little bit behind on time, but we will be extending the session to address some of the many questions you guys have already posted. So do continue tuning in if you can. So Kelly, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Felicia. Wow, thanks, Boon. I was also taking a lesson. <laughs> Because I think, you know, as a small studio, sometimes we always seem like when we talk about fee, always very paisay, paisay, you know, the Asian thing. But uh, you're, you're right, you know, sometimes these kind of things have to be blunt and uh, we, we deserve to be paid for the work we do. And, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, we actually have quite many questions uh, here. I'm going to uh, post to uh, you guys uh, some of the questions that were asked here. Okay, so to the panelists or speakers, uh, to the panel of speakers, uh, her question here is, what are some challenges you guys face when, uh, when you, you were expanding? One man show here, exclam exclamation mark. So someone is uh, asking a question. Uh, maybe we, uh, shall we start with uh, maybe Ting Shang, the small studios? Uh, okay, because yeah, I, I, I know that the question is from a one-man show. I think I'm quite lucky that uh, I actually have a very good co-founder here uh, in Pamela. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think initially when we started the small studio, of course, the, uh, doing furniture and homeware, two people, is like you need really a lot of hands uh, to help. Uh, it could be very operational, uh, but also operational people might not be the talent that you need. Uh, but then, yes, you just need all the help you can get. So I think in the beginning, we were relying more on just uh, possible interns. Yeah, interns and, uh, I mean, basically, like, part-time people as well. But we found that uh, it's actually, when we actually found the right talents, then that was when the company started to, we were able to delegate and uh, grow the company even better. So I really firmly believe that um, finding the right team members and the right teammates actually helps to bring the studio up to where we are today. Mm -hmm. uh, how about uh, Gabriel, do you want to share uh, your challenges? Uh, yeah, I mean, as, as you know, I was, I was part of this group out of stock design for many years, for like almost 10 years. So we were always four people working together uh, with, yeah, we had some full-time staff as well and some interns. So when we decided to go out our individual practice way like in 2016 i was basically back to my own uh just myself alone um, in the office and uh we we, we basically had to start all over again like, and, and um yeah me working with uh some students that came on internships and taking whatever projects that we could get i mean People don't know this, but maybe I spoke to Kelly. My, my first project when I when I restarted my own studio was like a Vietnamese nail spa and an Indian sari shop that was never built because they didn't have budget to build my designs. Uh, but at least, thankfully, I got paid for the hours that I spent on it. It was aborted halfway. And at that point, I was thinking like, okay, maybe I should just uh, close shop really, you know, because it's like, spend so much time on two projects, aborted halfway, never built. Uh, the client was happy to just uh, pay me whatever hours to terminate. Um, but eventually, I mean, things got better after I would say one year or, or 18 months and uh, old clients came back and, and new clients came and uh, it was also partly due to people who believe like, you know, people who are still willing to come on internships, even though we are no longer out of stock design, it's just Gabriel Tan, uh, but people still want to come on. In yeah. Sorry? <laughs> when they come for internship, they say we are out of stock. Yeah, exactly. They say, sorry, the other partners have... Uh, <laughs> I'm not here, but uh, yeah, but I mean, I still keep a good relationship with the people who 
who came on the early days, you know, coming from Germany or France or Belgium to intern when I'm just just me in the studio and them, uh, it's also not easy for 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 these young kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so guys, yeah. I mean the full story of how Gabriel um you know grew as a studio actually is on the podcast studio SML. So please go to the Spotify and listen to his full story. And uh, Randy also actually shared on his interview that when he first started, he had to measure water tanks on the rooftops <laughs> to just, you know, get by and put bread on the table. Uh, Randy, you want to share how you break through that and uh, got, your, got your first wow. project? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's true. I, I really, uh, it was a three-day work, um, $500. Um, that was 1999. Um, I guess um, uh, the question for us is, I mean, for us is that uh, when do we expand, right? Do we have uh, enough, uh, I mean, the, the, the job come first, then we, we employ people or not? So, so I think my trajectory here is actually most of my artists are friends and they actually recommend, uh, started to recommend uh, uh, clients. So it's actually from the artist side that I, I start to grow because it can be a simple thing as the artists themselves who say, you know, rather I got this great idea. I want this thing to be floating in the air without legs and without any support. And there you go. It become a commission for me to kind of help them out to build the things. So from there, it kind of grew. Um, of course, you the same trajectory. You, 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 you do design work from um, mostly ID first. And then... Uh, from there, you you kind of um, of 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 grow with uh, not with permanent staff, of course. Uh, there were the intern, and of course, I must uh, um, mention this. I mean, you have just mentioned Tangwambi. He was very nice to give me a table uh, in his office for me to begin my practice. So, so um, I must say that uh, there is um, uh, the per- that there is the patronage um, uh, which uh, Mr. Tang had been one of the very instrumental person. I mean, he, he's an architect, of course, like you mentioned, uh, who given me a leg up. Because right now to where do you operate from, paying rent, uh, is an issue, let alone to, to employ one. So, so you just need a space. And there, I guess, uh, by, by that process of, 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 of that journey, you, you, yeah, you, you, you just grow like, yeah, in, in that way. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Boon, I remember the first time I met you was uh, actually in Kelvin's basement at the house in Geylang. So how did you guys uh, have a turning point and uh, break out of the basement and uh, grow into the, the firm that you are today, which is uh, 70 or 80 people strong in the region? Right. So uh, yes, you remember it very well. So Geylang basement was uh, a 2.1 2. meter headroom, right? It's terrible. But uh, I think you we were watching every dime, right? Uh, uh, so it was free rental. Uh, you you lease everything so you don't buy. You know you work with interns. Everything to make sure that that you survive through that period. And really, I think what happens is that when you do something nicely and well, and get it completed, it leads to the next thing, right? And you know, it's like our type of work is always by referral or when someone's pleased with your work and so on, you get referred. And I think it's really a step at a time. And I think you, you hit a point of, uh, of kind of a leap, right? Where suddenly there's enough work to hire the next person and the next person. Uh, and then suddenly you are jumping and doing something else. You're looking at working out what cash flow you have to pay staff, right? Uh, and then how to get the next client in. So it's, it's a really exciting journey. And, and uh, I think it starts off um, one small step at a time. Okay, I think, uh, I think that happens to, to most design studios, uh, kind of organic growth, right? Slow, slow and steady. Yeah, so I, I think I want to move on quickly to the next question um, because there, there are actually quite a lot here. Um, okay, so this question was uh, actually directed to Boon Yang since, uh, since we're with you now. Uh, so KS said, earning less is happening to the advertising industry also. How to pay designers? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, you know, we, we are always grouching about it, right? Because really, I think not, not just architects, the creative field seem to be very undervalued, you know, but I think it's also part of a changing pattern, right? 
where in advertising now, people don't do billboards, they don't do newspaper print, everything is online. So this big transition of, of the whole industry, right? Uh, in architecture as well, even though there's more technology, there's more compliance, right? So at some point, we have to figure out how to find a productive time to, to produce work nicely. That is why I do a lot of my work outside, just to satisfy my creative kind of needs, right? Because if I only practice in Singapore, I think it's very tough. It's, it's a very tough world, especially at our type of size, right? Um, you know, the, the cost of doing business in Singapore is extremely expensive. I'll share something with you. We do a lot of hotels, right? And we always uh, usually compete with someone from Barcelona or, or, or Paris or London or UK or, or US uh, um, for a particular job overseas. We're often told that our fee is the highest, right? And this is us working out man hours very carefully. And the fact is that we're being priced out of the market by Singapore, right? Singapore is damn expensive, rental, then um, hiring locals and everything. So I don't know, man. I don't know what the, the magic bullet is, but you have really have to watch costs. That is why I have my offices now in Bangkok, uh, we're studying one in Europe, where it's a very low cost base. I would say that those places is half my cost here. So I'm able to deliver on a project and charge half the man hour time. So that's something that may have to happen. It may be through collaboration. So you do the front end design, you collaborate with somebody else from somewhere else who's able to help to see through a project at a much lower cost. Um, yeah, so the, those are the realities on the ground. And it's, it is sad, but that's the reality. And, and you just have to find a way to, to get past that and survive. Thanks for the answer. Okay, the next question is uh, uh, to all the speakers. Thank you for sharing. Do you feel that a physical studio space is really needed for growing heads versus building a community as Randy mentioned. Okay, so maybe Randy, you want to take the question? Um, it, it, you know, it's not the physicality. I, I, I want to say that uh, um, the answer here is that it, it's really um, uh, a meeting point, you know. I, I felt that, uh, of course, you can operate from home as well. But the reference that I'm trying to say here is um, um, doing a practice in Singapore can be quite lonely lah, because, uh, uh, I mean, um, there, there's always this, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, um, we are all so busy, we hardly uh, meet time to have a discourse. Okay, it's very important. You meet up, it doesn't need to be your your fellow architects. What I mean is that it's a space that you, you meet up and you can discuss um, possibility. So um, it is important that there is a meeting and you can see a lot of the, the, the modernist uh, art movement, I mean, um, it arises out from a collective, you see. So that the emphasizing part, I wonder to say is uh, the, the, it, the design studio, the starting out is that you do not see yourself as, um, uh, as, as just one, one person in the studio, but I think you lend strength, you, 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 you aspire, you look at what your peer, uh, and, 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 and see the energy, because at the end of the day, it is about this energy that you need to rally from the community. Hence, the space here is um, physical as much as it's also a, a, a mental one. Yeah. Uh, uh, on that note, Gabriel, maybe I ask you because you physically uh, moved from Singapore to uh, to Portugal. Um, so, do you think that the the idea of physicality has an effect or impact on you as a designer? Um, for me, not so much. But I think my my studio has kind of gotten used to to this that I am working remotely. Uh, with them but i'm super active on whatsapp you know be it day or night or midnight or three in the morning so it's not so good for my health but then i try to keep up with whatever's going on in the studio as much as possible and there are three of them in the singapore office uh, maybe expanding to four so that the main thing is that they have a good rapport and they all like each other they work well together and then i operate as a kind of satellite um and uh i i when i see new things in 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 different parts of wherever I am, I try to share with them so that they also, I mean, I think with the lockdown, it's very difficult as well because people want to travel, but they, they are not able to. So 
I'm thankful that I still am able to go to Milan Fair and things like that. And I try to share as much as I can with, with my office um, and, and to try to keep in, in constant contact. So, but in the beginning, yeah, it was tough and it was a little bit difficult to keep people happy. But I think after one year now, it's, it's quite, we've gotten used to it. Yeah. Okay. And, and to Jessica and, and Pamela on the, this idea of physical space, you guys run a retail shop. So uh, conventionally, you know, for retail, the physical space is very important. But now, you know, with COVID and also the 21st century is really everything is online. What, what's, your, uh, what's your take on physical space versus online for retail? I think for us, actually, the retail space is a very important space because we don't run it like a like just a shop. I think it is to create a whole philosophy and environment where people step in and feel like it's their home. I think like, I mean, because like our designs are really just really about the experience and the stories. It is actually kind of important for us. Uh, having said that, I think all our retail shops are previously, uh, we had one in Raffles Hotel and then we uh, have one, the first one that we opened was in Beach Road. Uh, we, we are actually closing these stores because they're in the city center. And I think because of COVID, uh, we find that it no longer makes sense to pay the rents for uh, a city center kind of space. But we also find that it is important still because people want to come down and touch and feel and experience. I think also part of the joy of our customers is also like speaking with our retail staff, speaking with us to understand about the story. I think that people don't buy our products because of like price points or whatever per se. I think it's really about the interaction there. And I think it is still important. So we have actually moved to a bigger space. We are in the midst of setting up uh, opening in October. Um, we want to create this whole environment. Uh, it's a lot bigger than our current stores. Uh, our current stores are about 1,000 square feet each only, but we've moved to an industrial building where the rent is really, really cheap. I think we're quite lucky we got it at a... I think this is a good time also. I mean, you know, there are difficulties, but also at this time, there's also opportunities that come up that might not come up during COVID because uh, we found a unit that uh, actually was at a very good rate and I think it, it somehow just, uh, we felt that it meets our needs. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also wasn't like a sudden thing. It wasn't like we were forced to move in company because we also really knew that um, we needed this space. We needed to cut down the rent. It's just that COVID just forced us to move this faster. And I think in a way also, it, worked, uh, it works out well for us. So yeah, I think I would think that physical space is important, but um, I think as it's grown quite organically, I think changes come along the way, and uh, because we're still kind of small, we can still react fast enough. Like for example, to like actually we actually terminated uh, the lease for office early, earlier to uh, move into a bigger space to cut down the cost and all that kind of stuff. So I think it all works out. Uh, in the end, yeah. I think also that like you know um there's something about synergistic exchange with the team that you you can get on um, a virtual call and everything but it's, it's just different when you come together in a physical space and I think that's necessary from time to time like, I mean, I'm not saying like you know like I guess with this situation it's it's um it's fine we can do to really try and like meet all together but we try as much as possible if we can to get a, you know get as much physical interaction as we can um, yeah, no. so I think to a certain extent and for the need that we, we, we require it is necessary mm -hmm. okay so I want to touch a bit on this uh, issue that a lot of my uh, friends who, are, who, who run design studios about they say that you know millennials these days uh, you know they, they, they value you know work-life balance uh, no, no longer they are like our generation where well, I must work very hard uh, must you know achieve uh, must this and that so um a lot of them you know come and go so so the question is actually now uh from one of the the audience here how do you guys tackle the problem of finding and retaining talents uh shall we start with Boon? oh i know all about that yeah well i think the reality is that you know you see all types of people right uh, it is true that the younger generation now, especially from comfortable backgrounds, don't value that long-term professional uh, definition of, of, of craft and, and their work. But you find the people who, who still believe in that, right? And um, I think in our type of work, it could be furniture, it could be architecture. The approach of design and craft means mentorship. It means time 
spend on the ground. There's no shortcut, right? If you dabble, you never be good, right? So these people will come and go, uh, but you have, you have people who are naturally tuned to this and they will stay. So they're not, they're less and less harder to find. I mean, uh, uh, it used to be, you can hire from all over, right? But now it's so difficult, you know, with the EP and all that. But um, you, you have to find these people and then in some ways, uh, they follow your work too, right? So if you have something that's compelling, they also want to work there because they want to learn something. Uh, you know, I can expect people to stay with me forever. That's not realistic, right? But I think if people give you the energy and time and you they learn something good, right? Uh, uh, that is the way the world has always operated. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I, I also pose this question to Randy, who is a M size uh, firm. How do you retain uh, and keep your talents? Um, well, um, it, it, it is uh, the hardest part of, um, of, of running a practice right now. Um, but I must say that uh, um, it is reciprocal. It's not, uh, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it, what is important here is, um, I guess, to understand that uh, the millennial come from, come from about, I mean, their value system is quite different, as we all know. It's about that meaning. Uh, and, and you can really get it when um, the last three years, uh, they interview you instead. They ask, uh, what is the CSR for, for, for the company? Do we do, we do outposts to build um, um, uh, for some off-grid uh, communities and all that? You can really see, see that. So in other words, uh, I think for me, the retaining of talents and the engagement here is uh, meaningfully, right? The, the, the office uh, will need to have... Um, the aspect of the community engagement, which we do quite a fair bit. I mean, we are quite involved with the arts community, with the urban uh, farming movement, with the conservative movement to preserve Golden Mouth Tower. I think these are, I won't call it activity, getting together, but they are belief that um, uh, what the firm actually stands for. And I think this is just uh, one of the few ways, uh, apart from the remuneration, as well as the job, uh, satisfaction that they must get. Lah. But definitely communication as well as getting that 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 kind of uh, pat in the back uh, is kind of important way of getting them engaged all the time. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Randy. Okay, we uh, I think we are running out of time. So, uh, but there, there are actually a lot of uh, questions here. So I'm just going to uh, pick one uh, and then... Uh, for all of you to wrap up. Uh, okay, so I, I think really, uh, okay, there's a few that is uh, repeated. What would be your advice for uh, startups, uh, small brands, you know, um, with small budget, <laughs> who want to start their own studio today? Because I think for, for especially Boone and Randy, who, you know, we are a little bit older, um, during our time, I think uh, Singapore, the standard of living is not so high. Starting, you know, starting out, the, the entry barrier is still not so high. I think Jessica and Gabriel in their 30s is like in between. But I think in this day and age, those who want to start up in their 20s, uh, I think the entry barrier is much higher. So what would be your last word and advice to the young people who want to start up their own small studio? Okay, um, I'll, I'll shoot first, yeah? Um, you're right. So this issue of the very high cost of entry means that you really might be able to do uh, uh, it could be a design service, it could be a product, but it must be viable and you must do some napkin calculations. That would be a cafe or restaurant, same thing, right? You must work out cost and, and income coming in and then your worth, you know, whether you're good enough to attract the work that's going to keep you going. So you must be very honest with yourself and you will know when the moment is right. You know that, ah, this guy is going to pay me this to, to, to commission me to do this work. So I think you have to be quite realistic and don't dream, right? Be very clear about the facts. But there's always risk. You ultimately still get, must take that leap off the edge of the cliff and take that risk uh, and do something like this if you really dream about it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Randy, what's your advice? Well, um, don't hurry. I, I believe that uh, it's important that uh, one really see work in a, in, a, in a practice, understand the practice. And then here 
comes the confidence and belief. Lah. But very important is that, of course, uh, uh, that big jump to, to start a firm, uh, I guess, is, is a very personal one. Uh, the conviction, therefore, is really um, how you could tap on uh, already known knowledge from your peer or, or someone senior. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Gabriel, your advice? Um, I mean, as much as possible, I tried to do everything myself at the beginning, to be honest, uh, until it came to a point where I, I realized I needed other skill sets and other... Um, but once, once, once... I mean, I would say to identify weaknesses or, or strengths that you want, or weaknesses of yourself and strengths that you need to complement your, yourself. And then either you, if you cannot afford to hire, you get in a partner. That is the easiest way to, um, yeah, to grow as a studio. You get in partners you know, that complement your skill sets and bring something that you, you, you don't offer. That's good advice. Uh, how about Jessica and Pamela? Do you want to wrap up the session with your advice to people who want to start up their own studio? Um, I think be open-minded, always be willing to keep, learn from people, ask questions from people who have gone before. Um, and I think also not be prideful, like be, be really open to work with, with, to work with anything that kind of comes um, at you first. I think at the start, you know, you have nothing at all, right? So like whatever comes at you, like just be open-minded and you know, and not prideful and just like, okay, you know, just try it out, gain some experience. And then from there, start to build your identity and like, you know, then you can ask for more in, in future. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think that part about being, uh, not being prideful is quite important. I think it's just to be genuine. I think that if you really want to grow, you definitely need to build all these relationships and you really never know. Like I think people that have met right at the start, I think, uh, I was a young student and I, went, I visited night and day and, and that's the first time I actually met Kelly. I think, you know, you never know at that point of time, you know, you, you meet this person and after that, like, I mean, I think Kelly has become kind of like also a mentor for us. Mm -hmm. You know, each interaction here, I right, always counts for something, I think, at the end. And like, I think as long as you're just genuine and you yeah, are willing to learn, I think, I think you have to get that right from the beginning, yeah. And yeah. Uh, Randy, we need to start another night and day. <laughs> In the end, it's true. Yes. Incubation. <laughs> yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We, uh, I think we had a very uh, good session today. Uh, thank you for your time. And thank you for uh, being my first uh, people for Studio SML. So uh, I also want to thank all the audience today who uh, came off to, uh, to listen to our talk uh, and to share with us. Um, to the many questions that we still couldn't answer. I think uh, we, will, we will have a platform to, to answer you privately. We will also send the individual questions to the panelists. Uh, yeah, because some of them are, are quite specific. Um, so yes, to actually listen to their full stories, please uh, log on to our website, uh, studio sml.net. And also, we have actually a uh, podcast uh, on uh, Spotify. So you just go to Spotify and search for Studio SML and you can listen to all, all our speakers today and uh, their in-depth stories. And uh, there is also an exhibition at National Design uh, Centre right now, which, uh, which is called Abstract Creatures, uh, featuring the, the panellists today, actually. So uh, please visit. 